These webcams don't sit on anything. Like it's so hard, it's weird. It's made for a monitor, right? Am I staying? How long is this presentation? It's, it's well, the whole thing Okay, okay. Yeah. 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 So we get uh, started. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome. Great to see you today. I, uh, I just had the great pleasure of, um, of spending the last three hours with the transition team. City planning went first. Uh, you don't do that every day. That was a lot of, it was a tremendous amount of fun. Uh, it's really great to have so many of you here for our very special guest today, who I will introduce momentarily. But before I begin, what I'd like to do is just get a sense of who we have in the room. It's a little bit of feedback here. We have a, not a sure. handheld. Is that why? Should I take the handheld? Yeah. Great. Sure. That might be why there's feedback. So just a little bit about who is in the room here. So if you are from the City Planning Division, put up your hand. So probably two-thirds of the group. Uh, transportation Services. They sit, they stick together a little bit. Um, okay, how many people in the room are engineers? Put your hand up in the room. Okay, a few. Uh, how many people are planners? Land use planners, probably most of you in the room. Planners. Uh, who else do we have in the room? So, show out some of your other disciplines, areas of expertise. Parks. Parks. Oh, parks. Urban design. Uh, everyone is in urban design. Put your hand up in the room. Okay, we have a good showing for urban design. And parks. Our friends from parks. One friend from parks. <laughs> welcome. Welcome. You are among friends here. Um, I'm really, really excited that all of you are here today for this special Lunch and Learn. In part because I had the great pleasure and the great honor. This past summer, I was invited to Australia by the Australian Planning Institute to present in four different cities on some of the work that we're doing here in the city of Toronto, in particular as it relates to our growth plan, our urban intensification, the redevelopment of our land, uh, some of our precinct planning, and it was a, a very exciting thing to do. And while I was there, I had the great pleasure, of course, of seeing some Australian cities. And uh, Australian cities are, there's some things that we're actually doing better than many Australian cities, and then there's a lot of things that Australian cities are doing better than we are. And a lot of that has to do with street design, and it also has to do with the public realm. How many people here in the room have had the great pleasure of traveling to Australia? Here, throw your hands up in the air. You're a well-traveled group. That's an, uh, that's an incredible amount of people. Well, it is my great pleasure to introduce a, uh, a true Australian today who is here, and we're very fortunate because Stephen uh, was undertaking a North American tour, spending some time on the West Coast. Were you in San Fran? Is that where you just came from? San Francisco. And when I met Stephen, he and I were both speaking in Perth on a, at a planning conference. And I was completely dazzled by Stephen's presentation. And one of the reasons I was dazzled by it is because he did such a wonderful job of bridging the conversation between planning, urban design, and engineering and playing places for people. And Stephen is, by training, an engineer. Now, interestingly, he sounds like a planner when he talks. Or maybe not. Maybe he's that evolution of, uh, of engineers. He is a leading contributor to planning, design, and development of livable cities in Australia, which of course, according to the Economic Intelligence Unit, has consistently ranked with, albeit Canadian cities, in the top 10 for livable boutique transportation consultancy, working primarily as an engineer and an urban strategist on the development of long-term plans related to urban form, mobility, and viability. He is also the author of Complete Streets. 
Guidelines to Urban Street Design, which was published in 2010. One of the reasons that I was so excited when I heard Stephen speak in the Australian context was because I felt that he added a layer to the conversation about street design as being a critical part of how we create livable places. And he actually built some language around street design that broadened the way we can actually think about our street infrastructure as being a critical part of how we plan our cities. For those of you who uh, didn't participate in our forum on Complete Streets several weeks ago, we have an initiative that we're undertaking in the context of the City of Toronto as per Council of Direction. It's an interdivisional initiative that is being co-led by City Planning and Transportation Services. And in the context of that exercise, we are generating complete street design guidelines for the City of Toronto. We recognize that given we have a real diversity of types of different kinds of streets in our city, and we recognize that as a result of that, this is a pretty complex exercise. But at the same time, we recognize that it's about changing the way we think about our city, that we need to think about our street infrastructure, we need to think, think about our street infrastructure, we need to think about the public realm in a fundamentally different way from how we've really thought about it over the past couple of generations, which has really been a framework that has been about moving cars. That the future of the city is about recognizing our streets as a critical part of the public realm, and that our framework really needs to be driven by an understanding that as a critical asset in our infrastructure as a city, that our streets are in fact places for people. Sometimes places for people to shop, sometimes places for people to linger, often places for people to move. So I'm really thrilled to have all of you in the room here today because this is a step along that larger process of building those complete street guidelines. I'm thrilled that Stephen was able to fly to this side of the continent, since you were so far away from home anyway, uh, to be with us today and to present some of the great work from the Australian context. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Burgess. Thank you for having me, everybody. Uh, g'day, I suppose is the proper way to start. And on that, I must probably warn you, English is my first and only language, but I'm still not very good at it. So I'll use lots of colloquialisms a bit, so if, if there's an Australian thing, just say, what the hell is that? Just no worries, I'll, I'll charge you here. For some particular sin, I completed some trouble, I did develop a book called Complete Streets Down Under in Australia, and it was really hard work, and I know you guys are just getting to the part where you think you're on top of it, and I just thought I'd share a few stories about how we got to where we are, and the mistakes we made, and where we're making some advances. And it's got a lot to do with where we come from. Um, there's a few of you who have been to Australia. Um, it's a strange place, partly dictated by the fact that there's no water there in Australia, but there's still not lots of people, but there are people, because there's no water, we are the most urbanised place on earth. So there's more people living in towns and cities <coughs> compared to rural living than anywhere else in the world. Which is probably a different picture than some people get the outback and the big stock stations and stuff, but the density is so low out there. Seven percent of our housing product, our existing housing product is detached the house on land. But the weird thing is that 90% of our new product is detached house and land. And our cities, well, I guess this is a Canadian thing, our cities are a long, long way apart. Uh, you don't drive from one city to another in Australia. Well, it's days, not hours, to get from one place to another. So there's big, long stretches of nothing, and then big blobs of red roofs or roofs like the over there. So it's put together slightly strangely and it causes us a few issues. We keep winning all these awards for being the most livable cities ever, and they do look beautiful. Uh, and you probably recognise the government, so the one on the left is beautiful Sydney Harbour at night time. Yeah. Uh, no one missed out on seeing that when they went to Australia today. Don't go to Australia and not see that. It is wonderful. It's a beautiful harbour and the whole city revolves around it. It makes an awkward shape and it's kind of tricky to get around, but it is beautiful. Uh, Melbourne is this is where I live. It's interesting in a completely different way, probably more urban, if I can use that phrase, and the city centre itself 
is very, very mobile. It had to be reconstructed that way. It sort of fell away and became, sort of became Bacon Core. We had a clever little guy called Professor Adams, and he came and fixed it all up and slowly bit by bit. He moved people back into those laneways that were just garbage bins, and he moved people back into the city that could actually live, work, and play. And it's the cities themselves that are beautiful and engaging, but we've got a bit of a problem. We've got these unsustainable suburbs at four, five, six dwellings per, uh, dwellings per hectare. Yes, these dwellings per hectare. Yeah. I had trouble with that in San Francisco because I couldn't convert it in my head. So, this is really bad. They're so sparsely spread out that I can't collect them all up with a bus, so they have to drive a car so we get all these issues. We're now taken over from the United States as the fattest country on earth, Australia. And my children's generation will be the first generation of Australians, their life expectancy is less than their parents. We're getting kids with type 2 or late onset diabetes as teenagers is not uncommon because they live in places like this. A guy sent me this photo when I was writing the Complete Streets book. He said, Steve, you've got to put this street in the book. It's a perfect street. <laughs> <laughs> the Australian expression for that street is actually shit out. <laughs> it's a terrible street. But it was a little bit funny. He said, oh, well, that's a stupid thing to do. He had a reason. This guy was a long standing developer, and his father was before him at doing house and land development in regional cities in Australia. Cities of about 80, 90, 100,000 people all up and down the Queensland coast where there's mining money. And he was pumping these out and selling them as fast as he could build them. He had a reason for saying this is a perfect street, because after all those years as a developer, that was the first one that had gone through a council that had been involved in and got a tick at every stop. He had it in market within nine months of submitting an application. He was selling his blocks off the plan. He's fast as ever. So he had every right to think it was a perfect street. It met that council's code exactly. So meeting all the rules, this is what we get. We're not allowed to build this anymore. Our code doesn't let us do that. These buildings haven't got enough parking with them. There's not enough width. There's not enough building setback. Can't fit enough services. We're not allowed to build that anymore. But this is one of the most photographed streets in Australia. People love it. Hardware lane. This is what the code says we have to build now. Who takes photos of this and sends them to their mates in Europe? <laughs> Nobody. It's revolting. Nobody likes it. But the code says this is what we have to build. So we had to start to tell a different story. So off we went around. This particular one started off in Queensland, which is the second biggest stage geographically, the third biggest one. Uh, going around all the industry saying, look, we're going to write a new complete streets code. What do you want? To, how do you want to change? We had about three or 400 industry reps come to these workshops, all big towns, little towns all over the place. And we discovered that we really, the, the current codes were genuinely out of sync with what people wanted, what the development entry expect, expected, and what the real estate market wanted as well. So we were missing the beat. And we had three things that we generally had to address. We had the hierarchy of users upside down. I'll talk about that in a minute. Our street hierarchy was, hierarchy was based on traffic volume and traffic volume alone, nothing else which was out of sync with almost everybody. And our design process was pretty much the opposite to what I've got written here at the bottom, land use, function, and form. Ours went traffic volume, which dictated form, and then you had to try and muscle some function out of the finish. So we had it the wrong way around. So that were three big things to address. This is the one people thought was going to be the easiest. We go to any local government, anywhere in Australia, I was telling you're right on this, Steve, but we're already all over it. We put pedestrians at the top of our list, motor vehicles at the bottom. We're 100% agree with you on that. We're all on board with this. Until I put to them a real life scenario that if I bought up a dozen houses on the fringe of the CBD, I would rent a house and I'd knock it down and put up 15 nice two, three story townhouses for some families to live close to the city. 
said, yeah, okay, we can handle it. Well, that's good sort of thing. I said, yep, and I'm going to put all this money to, not doing up the footpath in my street, but I'll put some money towards your citywide pedestrian scheme, whatever it is, whatever you're doing. It's pathways, footpaths, and some cycleway money for you, a bit of that. And the bus stop on my street's just a little old flag and pole. I'm going to put a big shelter. I'll put Steve Burge developments on the back of it. But I'm not going to have any parking on my development because I'm so close to town I might need it. And I've got a bus stop, I'm funded all that active transport stuff. And I'm obviously not going to do a traffic impact assessment because I don't expect there to be any traffic. And they laugh at me and say, no, no, no. First thing you have to do before you can get a pre development is you've got to get me a traffic impact assessment and you've got to tell me how you're going to meet the minimum parking cap. First things. Then we'll talk about that other stuff later. This thing is still at the top of the tree. I can't talk to anyone about my development until I satisfy all requirements for the motor vehicle. Then and only then can I start talking to anyone else. And that's still the current situation. And only, in fact, probably a hundred, I'd say, local governments I've talked to. Only one little town, when I told them that story, said, oh, we don't have a look at it. There's a little old Hobart. Has anyone been to Hobart? Hobart's our second oldest city, right down to the very bottom of the island state, the wee island that hangs off the bottom of Australia. The little city, the, call it a capital city, it's only about 2,000 people. Right? Beautiful little convict town. They said, well, yeah, we'd have a look at that. Only one town. Everyone else, no, no, no. You've got to sort these blokes out first before you worry about any of this stuff. That is a multi generational change that is harder to do than you think. Did anyone go to NACTO last week in San Francisco? A lot of talk about complete streets and stuff, but you can still see the mindset is, oh, what am I going to tell the traffic engineers? Oh, this kind of thing. That's still the one thing at the top of everyone's head. We're a long way off doing this completely. I basically stole this off. Has anyone heard of a book called um, the, the UK Manual of Streets? It's, uh, it's sort of a little bit hard work. For Australia, it's got lots of words in it, not enough pictures. It's a big, big book. But it does this bit very well, this street hierarchy. It bases its hierarchy of street on the land uses that it wants to sustain. Doesn't do this is the Australian one. I don't know what you guys do, but this is the typical of our current street codes. Our street hierarchy is just our road hierarchy that gets smaller. And it's all based on traffic volume. If I'm trying to trade on it, if I'm trying to put offices there, or retail, commercial, residential, that all doesn't matter. This is how the hierarchy is built up. And we get a place like this. Is this familiar to you? This is sort of yes. yeah. And this still makes up a massive amount of our product. What about this street pattern over on the left hand side? Where do you see that street pattern? Downtown area. Okay. The bits that we built before we had cars, they look like that. Because they basically have to. Okay. If you haven't got a car, your street never works well like that. But if you have got a car, you can live in one of these. Can you live in one of these if you haven't got a car? Any bus plans here? How are you going around here? It's your worst nightmare, isn't it? Okay. You can't collect these people up. You might be able to get a few in this middle thing here, but you can't get them. This guy has to walk this way to get to the bus stop. It's, it's a non-functioning place if you haven't got a car. So we're basically making all this. Keeping in mind, this is 90% of the new housing product in Australia comes out like this, and they have to use a car to participate in human life. <coughs> we're forcing them to do that. They've got no choice. If they lose their car in there, they lose access to fresh food, to school, to footy practice, to ballet, to work, to everything. What's the most dangerous way to get about? Car. Not only because we smash into each other all the time, that's only the tip of the iceberg. How we kill most of them 
is through heart disease, diabetes, obesity. That's how the car gets people in Australia, by filtering in places like this. The car's like smoking cigarettes. If you do it often enough, it will get you. And yet we are forcing people to do it all the time, which is plain mean. We shouldn't do it. We have to change the comments to get out of this model and get into that one over there. There'll be some of you who recognise sort of what that is, they come in slightly different forms, but who knows what that is? Yes. <laughs> Here's downtown Melbourne, it's the output from a traffic model, yeah? So the bright green ones are the ones where you're in strife, and the response to when you get a bright green line, or depending on what yours, yours might be bright orange or bright purple or whatever it is, when you get a bright purple line, what do you do with it? Throw capacity out. And yet, there's not enough black stuff here. We've got to get rid of that bright purple line so the city can function economically. We want people to move. If you're building roads, that makes sense, doesn't it? A road generates its economic benefit from connecting things. People have to move along. That's where it generates its economic benefit. You cannot apply road design techniques to a street, they are different things. It's like getting a vet to do surgery on you. They're slightly related, but they're not the same thing. If you try and apply that road design capacity to a street, you end up in a mess like this. And I'll tell you a wee story about it. I know this intersection because it was next to my old office. At the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. Have you ever been there for a surf, for a look around? Get a suntan, spend all your money. Beautiful place. Beautiful surf beaches. It's a popular Australian tourist place as well as an international tourist place. This is a wee little intersection uh, at one of our last remaining beautiful little shopping streets down here. Uh, this is a caravan park. Is there a Canadian equivalent to a caravan park? Or a trail park, yeah. So you take your caravan up there for the holidays and stay by the beach for the summer and then you come home again. Uh, little shops that always go with the summer holiday, the ice cream shop, the pizza shop, the laundry, the chemist, all that sort of stuff on this corner here. Over here, this is a sort of a beachside resort. Um, it's also got a McDonald's in it. Yeah? keep making them. But this used to be a tiny little three way and it showed up bright green on one of these maps. Congestion, congested. And there was a bit of a delay getting out of here. So you have to a trucking engineer, Steve, can you fix this way? Yeah, I can fix that. Really good. I fixed the congestion problem, and they did come out like this. Okay? It's got a slip lane here, so these people don't have to stop for the red light. They've taken this pedestrian leg out on this side, so that they don't have to wait for the green man, or a white man in your case. They don't have to wait for the flashing man, so it gets all these right turns out. These get a free left, so they don't have to look a red signal on this. It works beautifully. There is no more congestion at this intersection. But, all these shops here, and now I'll get on and break. They've always got four lease signs on them, but they're mostly empty now. It's because mum and dad don't trust the kids to use this big intimidating black space anymore. It's too big for a kid to walk across the intersection. It's too intimidating. So all these, are all dwindling. They're basically all gone. The laundry has turned over three or four times in the last 12 months, and that's the only one left now, I think. All gone. McDonald's has a massive pulling power on little kids on summer holiday. So kids still go to McDonald's, but how do they get there now? Drive. Okay? Go over here down along this road, and there's somewhere back. And there's a car park in the back of McDonald's. That's what happens when you apply a road design technique to a street environment. Streets generate their use to the community by sustaining these land uses. And this street intersection has failed badly. Yeah. So their connection to the marginal community has been severed. An unintended consequence of fixing up a problem like delay. 
Would you really be better off just waiting 40 or 50 seconds? And all those people get their jobs, all those families get their income back, and all those people get to have a great summer holiday. They chucked it all away to save a few seconds. It's all so mean, isn't it? Didn't mean it. Someone asked that guy the wrong question. So can you get rid of this congestion? Of course I'd like can, it's easy. Can you fix this and keep all these people vibrant and participatory in the rich your community is a whole other question. Because I asked that person, I said, yeah, I can do that as well, but no one asked them to do that. Using road design techniques in a street environment that basically ignored all the people. There's a famous street in Melbourne, it's, um, except for the Bird Street Mall, which is right in the heart of the city, it is where the shops have to pay the highest rent. It's our famous shopping street, if you've ever been there for a holiday, there's a fair chance you've emptied a fair wacky little wallet in this street. It's got a flash end where all the Prada shops and stuff are, and it's got a, another end with sort of jean shops and a little sort of rusty the style cafe sort of down the other end. It's quite a complex and involved social environment and it's just, it's never had any real intervention, it's just crept up on itself. It's generally organically grown. It is one of our most popular streets, one of our most photographed streets and economically one of our most successful and it doesn't meet any of our street care guidelines at all. No, it doesn't even come close. Um, this diagram didn't make any sense in San Francisco because it's all in metric. <laughs> but you can see that if you do much of that, you're all going, oh, jeez, that's a bit narrow. <laughs> and actually, when you're there, you do that as well. You're walking in the yard, jeez, jeez. And all those participating, they complain. The, the shopkeepers and the pedestrian claim that that three metre footpath is not wide enough. There's too many people on it, they're all crowded, and you can see from the photos, they all crowd in, and there's trying to be some tables and chairs there, and it's just mayhem. The parking lane's not wide enough. The bike lane's not wide enough. 2.6 metre traffic lane, and there's a tram in it as well. And the, this bit in the middle, is that, that one and a half metre thing, is the tram stop. You have to stand there with a the tram going on the other side, and if you've got your briefcase down there, it will touch you. <laughs> <laughs> so the tram driver goes crook, these people stand in the middle just about shit themselves. <laughs> Works perfectly. <laughs> they all complain about the same amount, so that's an even score. Fair bump play on, we would say, in the Australian rules. Now, I'm not so sure you should. The message is people like this stuff. A 20 metre carriageway is any bigger than that, it, yeah, it's hard to get a two sided shopping street. So people walk down this side and they can see into the window of the other shop, and it's got enough pull to drag them across the street. Any wider than that, your shopkeepers have only got access to 50% of the wallets that they should have. There's a bit of talk at the moment to take out one of these parking lanes so everyone can just get a bit of breathing room. Yeah. Who's trying to take a parking lot and parking out in front of the shop anywhere? That's more fun than a barrel of monkeys down your shorts. Yeah. <laughs> so that's going to be interesting because it, it really, there is really too much going on in that space. But people, people crowding in, people are trying to get there because there's an active, vibrant, exciting place to be. People can't stay away from it. And because there's lots of people there, the shopkeepers make lots of money. People are walking past there. You can hardly drive down here. It's really a waste of time. So people walk. And the tram, because it's in the traffic lane, and there'll, there'll be two schools of thought on the PT. This will be interesting if someone wants to comment on this. The places where the tram runs with the traffic, are our good shopping street. The places where they're broom, and then the shops don't do anything. Tram gets a free hit. 
gets a rundown without being in amongst car congestion, but the street gets too wide, and then you don't get that double-sided shopping. Aboriginal on the town, I showed you before with the Monk Up intersection, they're building some new parts of their town. They bought an old golf course that was in the middle of the town, and they're trying to do all this stuff. So we've got a black slate. And the new engineers and planners and urban designers do when they've got plenty of room, they take it all. So there's a big wide footpath, about six metres, and then a big wide parking lane so you can open the door without hitting anyone, and then a two metre bike lane, and then a separate tram, and then a car, and then a big wide medium with some thumping big trees. That shop front is now oh, off the camera. <laughs> <laughs> that shop front is now a distant memory to me. Okay? That they, those streets don't work. And keep in mind what you do on streets for. Streets are, streets are places, they're part of the open space network, they generate their economic value by what happens on the edge. If what happening on the edge is uneconomical because of your street design, you made a mess of it and you have to start again. If all those shops are broke, it's not because necessarily they're bad trade it's not because your streets are a mess. You made an environment where they could not prosper. And there's no value in that for anybody. <laughs> Having wrote this beautiful book about all these wonderful changes we we're going to make, we've made a little bit of a mistake. Whereas to get all the ideas about change, we did all those workshops and build up the repertoire with the industry and said, what did you like to change, this, that, and the other. Then after we'd done our book, we did go back and do it all again. We listed, so here's our draft book, what do you think? They hate it. And it's one of the things about a local government that you all would have experienced and it does your head in and there's no ducking under it, is you're responsible for making improvement all the time, but you've got to promise not to change anything. Listen, that's your impossible task you're given every day. You have to manage this change. If I had my time over again, I reckon I would have had a head of hair if I had done this right instead of this. Go back and do it all again. Say, look, this is what we're thinking. Here's some test cases tried out. We did try some cases out on the ground, but we didn't go well enough with it. We... So when it came out, the people who came to the original workshops and wanted change and enthusiastic, they didn't bother commenting on the book because they sort of got their way. They well, good. The people who didn't come to the original stuff and didn't want any change, then they cut loose. Where's my old book? I want my old book back. This new one's stupid. Give me my old one back. And it nearly sunk the whole process. People who want to do it the old way. They have no concept of really whether that way was better, but it's the way. And it had been done before, and I lived through it, and no one sued me, so it must be. It's like I made it the perfect street. It's a terrible bloody street, but it goes through the system. System in that case is a fault, but it's a bit, it's a bridge too far for a lot of people if you don't take it on the road and you say, look, this is not good. Why is it good? We've got to prove it. That doesn't mean it's good or bad. It doesn't work because of this, this, and this, and we're changing because of this, this, and this. And we did that eventually. We started a heap of workshops. We called them the Lost Art of Street Design. Went all over Australia, we've probably done 40, but I could do them every day, but we've got, you know, because people sort of, they, they like being part of the change process. Once they get it, they like being part of the process, but we left this stuff a bit too late. Uh, the guys in Auckland, as I said, they're doing theirs, and they asked me a question, they said, roughly how much of the budget did you spend on writing a book compared to educating the people about the book. I said it ended up being about 50-50, but if I had my time over again, I would have done 10-90. The more you spend on spreading the word, the less stuff has to be in your book. You don't have to tell people stuff they already know. A broad list of principles, and then a very, very well thought out participatory education program and your book only has to be half as big. 
people understand why they're doing stuff differently, they embrace it, and they tell their junior kids why they have to do it differently, and they tell them it's gone. That's how the system works, then we've always done it that way, it becomes the new way. And it was a, I can't tell you how important that is. Uh, this new NATO thing worried me slightly, but that same, very same thing. I saw some of those traffic engineers down at the, um, at the NATO conference and they were explaining how they're using the new book and they're all excited. It was like watching someone go straight out of areas with a baseball bat. It's just, it's, well, yeah, I've got an excuse to have not quite as many cars, which is not what it's about. It's about using a street to maximise its economic benefit, the whole reason it's there. Different to a road. Some of the arguments I heard were saying, oh yeah, but if I put the bus in, I can actually get more people down the street than I could if it was two car lanes. It's irrelevant. Streets have got nothing to do with street. Car behaviour is just irrelevant. The value in a street is all the businesses and lives and homes you sustain Another trick is whether you have a statutory code or a guideline. So, statutory codes, uh, is that what they call it? Statutory codes? So, when it's part of your law. If you need an approval, you have to do that box. So, whatever you call that. Anyway. Or you just have a guideline and say, well, these are the principles I want you to design by, go and do them if you do a good job, I'll give you a check. So it's too broad, basically, go about it. And there are advantages and disadvantages in both of them. If you have a statutory code, it becomes binary. If it looks like that, you get a tick, off you go and do it. If it doesn't look like that, you get a cross. And it's very easy to do it. So after a while, the most junior of the engineers and planners can design streets, because they only have to copy that. And the most junior of the planners and engineers can do an assessment because they just have to say, if it look like that, yes or no. The downside of that is the chance of a standard, codified, yes or no street being ideally suited to the place you're making is almost zero. What would possibly be the chance that it would match that environment? Almost none. What sort of shops are there? How big are the buildings? How dense? How many buses? How many buses can get to it, let alone go along it? All that stuff goes in. You need to apply your brain to design that. Which makes design a little bit more expensive, and it makes assessment a, uh, assessment a little bit more expensive, which is why to have a non statutory guideline and live and die by that sword, you can see why it taxes people. But the result is you get places that reflect that environment, that reflect that community, that reflect that local flora, that are places that someone's going to take a photo of and send back to their European mates saying, this is a Toronto street, don't you wish you were here? They're the ones you want to design. That's the legacy you want to leave behind. Street making, it's, it's not copying, it's actually design. It's a skill that you spent all those years learning and fostering. You know the difference between a good one and a bad one. And so a new street design guideline should release all that talent, not stop it. A template design allows an idiot to design a reasonable street, but it stops a good designer from making a good one. This is a wonderful city. The aim of the whole thing should be that you release all the talent that's locked up in it so that when I come here in 15 years, I'll be taking photos and sending them to my European counterparts and say, how do you like them apples? Yeah. And it's not to say there are remarkable streets here now, but it's, if it's anything like Sydney and Melbourne, there are only the special places in the middle that you sort of treasure and tinker with but the old suburban ones, as a matter of course, are stock, standard, boring, yuck. We don't want that. I've got a few of these things that, they're my personal sort of touchstones that I always roll around in my head when I'm going through the process. Um, they're a little bit childlike, I find, but they work for me. You're probably better off making up your own. 
but just a series of things that you go through in your brain. Particularly find us some touchstone exemplar streets that you like. And keep going back to them. Why do I like that? What draws me to it? Why are the business guys so successful? Or why are the people live there so happy? What, what, what makes it? Keep going over that process in your head. Am I letting the people go and live on this street that I'm building? Are they going to be happy with that? Do I need value at that? Is someone going to go there and say, oh, that street is really good. That's a bloody beauty. We need to have that conversation going. There's no excuse to do a boring one that no one noticed. For the tiny little bit extra that it might cost, for the generations of people that will interact with that, that wonderful space that you build. The land uses on the edge of your streets should prosper and be awesome. Should be an awesome place to live. Should be an awesome place to trade, to do business. Should be an awesome place to visit, to linger, to have a beer, to do stuff. To play, I was going to say play cricket, play baseball, play hockey. Yeah. Awesome places that promote communities that are engaged and active, that don't go from the living room to the ins, in the garage, push the button and drive to some other destination and don't even participate in what should be a beautiful and engaging public space. Thanks for listening to me. I've done a bit. Someone gets stuck in there without the to leave and start to death. Now there's nothing in there that happens. <clears throat> I'm slightly worried, A, for myself, but more for my industry back home, that this could be our new asbestos. Knowing full well that those people who live in those subdivisions have short lives, we're still sending them out there. That's the big liability risk. Whether someone crashes and breaks their leg and you get sued, that is piss and peanuts compared to this problem here. And I completely understand that's what they're saying. They're saying, oh, we've got no toilet. And they've got this little process they have to go through every time they widen the footpath by a quarter of an inch to reduce the width of that. That's a mess they've made for themselves that they have to get clear of so they can save people's lives. It's that important. And someone's got to help them realise that they're getting stuck in the weeds. That's probably the strain. Um, yeah? They're down here, with this, the big problems up here, and they're not even looking at it. I want to agree with the statement that congestion is a problem. And, you know, we get report after report from the Toronto Board of Trade, whatever congestion constitutes this all this year, this is a problem we have to solve. Uh, our streetcars go right in the wrong right way, and that's why they're slow, or it's reporting slowly. Regardless of what it is, we seem to be trying to solve the problem through COVID, like you said. And you've just said that that's irrelevant, and that seems to be like something that requires a profound cultural change. So I wonder if we could expand on the notion of congestion being irrelevant and why we need to change our idea. Yep. It gets tricky on a certain type of street, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But just to understand the basic difference between the road and the street. And a road does generate its economic benefit by its route. So if people are trying to get freight and people and school kids and whatever in buses along this big this and this congestion is important. 
These streets out here are important because they've got shops along the edge of them and bars and people live up on top of them and there's offices and stuff. And those land uses have to prosper. If you did a swap in Toronto and you could magically make all that throughput go up to 35, 40 miles an hour with almost no delay and you got a green light every time, those land uses would decay and disappear. So, and you'll and to get into congestion argument in an urban environment, you're talking about streets, not roads, you're arguing about the wrong thing. The real test, an annual report on your street should be sales tax. You know, it should be uh, BMI, body mass index, you know, how healthy the people are that live there. That's the measure of the quality of the street. So no one does, you know, I mean, to do Chatham Street, it's just 150% capacity, you know. If someone dies and you know, leaves their car and another one's ready to jump in that place, it's full, but it doesn't matter. People get there by the train, they get there by the tram, they walk. It's become extremely desirable to live there. So that congestion has had a massive input on the real estate there. If it was a free plane you could drive through and park wherever you like, then as a real estate place it would be nearly worthless. So we've, we've, now there's a combination, a link street or whatever, and it has to do both. And then normally like one or two through the middle of CBD, where you know they've got to get through somehow, and they generally gravitate to one or two, go across town or through town. And they've got big land use at either end, so there's an economic value of getting through, and you're trying to provide amenity on the edge as well. They're really difficult, and that's just got to be a balance. Quite a bit wide, and quite often they end up getting secondary land use, and I'm like not the high quality because too noisy to sit out there and have a beer or you know it's too noisy to enjoy the water you can't ride your bike down there so economically those streets suffer in a local sense but their road value their link value is still worth maintaining they're not as common as people would think those sort of streets but they are they're the tricky ones where you really have to, everyone sort of loses something Oh, um, I, I, I did have one mayor who was almost suicidally brave, um, and he survived the storm long enough to really cross the front. Um, he, uh, he was mayor of uh, Brisbane, which is the capital of Queensland, uh, and he got in just after we had the World Expo. So Brisbane was a really backwards mode. A really conservative town. Outdoor dining was forbidden. You weren't allowed to do it. And it was a really just a country town that happened to have a million people in it. He, um, first of all, he let them do outdoor dining and do all this outrageous stuff. And all the conservatives were saying, Oh, you're going to kill everyone. We're going to get salmonella and all sorts of stuff. So, anyway, he surfed all that out. And then, the council at the time owned about half the car parks in the city, and there was a little bit of people starting to move after the expo. People sort of found out that the city wasn't such a bad place to not only go and do business but actually live in as well. And he cut all the minimum parking rate and actually put a maximum parking rate on all developments so you could only do so much. And he doubled the price of parking overnight in the city for all the city owned car parks, and it went from $4.50 to $9.50 or something. That meant that all the private ones went from four dollars to nine dollars overnight. And I had the was the lucky guy I was in charge of all the traffic complaints that came into Brisbane City Council at the time. Brisbane City as a council's pretty big city. It had about eleven thousand employees at the time. So it's a big local government authority. And um, we used to get about a thousand complaints a month. And I like look old because this was before there was FEMA. And they'd all come in handwritten letters and they come a thousand a month, a thousand a month. And straight away after I did that, I went up to nearly 1800 for the next month. And the next month, straight back down. Finally, a little blip on the whole scheme of things. The story I tell those guys is that all the time I did that job, five years, no one's done it for that long since or before, and it's a really interesting job. City of the million people, all the traffic and planes coming through one this one. And all the time I was there, Jim spent millions and millions of dollars on transport infrastructure, street infrastructure, and road infrastructure, partially fixing all these complaints that come in. 
And after five years of spending millions and millions of dollars a year, what do you think happened to the thousand in once a week? Same. Feel the same. The point to get across to, to people who are exposed to that environment is that it's immune to what you do. That level will always stay the same. Parking, there's no more appointed thing than parking on that. Mrs. Smith drives into town, she can't get a spot in there. She rings up the mayor, mayor you're an idiot, there's not enough parking because I went to park there and I couldn't. So he builds a big parking station over here, so Mrs. Smith comes in after that, there's still some in the spot, mayor, you're still an idiot because of it. It makes no difference. That level of public pressure is identical. I come from slightly different places and slightly different areas and slightly different pressure groups. So you just got to steal them for it. They are robust, intelligent, proud people or they wouldn't have those political jobs, so you just got to look up and steer them in the right direction. Sometimes they'll have to be brave, and if they weren't, it's not their fault, it's probably yours. You just didn't steal enough. So and look, this is what will happen. Yeah, this is how you're going to fix it, and this is going to be the long term benefit. Off you go and do your job. Yeah. And you can steal them for that. You don't have to be as arrogant as you as I want them. You can put that message in there. The other thing, of course, is building capacity in the community so that when you change something, they understand the improvement, they just don't see the change. Yeah. It, this sounds a little bit harsh, but quite often we, the current environment will that. The politicians are sort of followers more than leaders, aren't they? Like, if everyone goes to talk about this, then that's their thing. So building capacity in the community to say, look, this is a good thing. You know, who wants to have happy, healthy kids? Like, well, this is how we're going to do it. So, you know, building capacity in the community is sometimes a shortcut to making those politicians be brave when they're actually doing what people want. <clears throat> Uh, Melbourne, you have streetcars that run through the central business area of downtown, and you also have them run in the suburbs. And once they go in the suburbs, a lot of the time they're in their own dedicated right away. Here, we don't have that. They're in mixed traffic most of the time, with the exception of St. Clair and Spadina, and those are two main streets. You said that you know those streets won't flourish if um, you dedicate the, the streetcar on them. But we, we have examples like Savannah is a very successful street where the retail seems to be doing fine and it's in a dedicated right away. That's what it's going to sound like. Yeah. Oh, they, they can be successful. It's just harder for them to be like they They just have to work harder because of that. And it's only width based. Oh, and a little bit traffic speed sometimes. If traffic's going too fast, it's not quite as yeah, the so, yeah. so the only problem there you might have is just distance, as in that people can't wander like brown cows across the street to shop yeah. and two sides at once, and that's the risk. And so the less wallets that do that, yeah. then, then the sort of the less efficient your retail is. As inefficient as that movement looks, that's what where how the money gets spent. So if you have you know footpath, bike lane, parking lane, tram lane being only halfway. It makes quite a lot of right away, and that, that's just the risk to it. What is all, and as I said, what ours do, and you're quite right, is in the downtown they all have to mix with traffic and fight, and they get a bit of a run, but then they go back into their old tram stop villages, yeah. they, they sneak back down in there again because those streets are skinny. They have the yeah. run where they yeah. stay efficient, where ours actually, like Queen Street, it's not a main street congestion for the whole length, so there's no place where it gets. Oh, yeah. either. So and, and that's the road street thing. So when ours get out of the streets and get onto the roads, then they get their own bit. Off you go. Um, but when they get back into the street environment, where they've got to support the land use, then they don't get their own go because the, the value of the shops on the edge is more important than the two or three minutes you might lose just mixing with traffic for that short bit. And it is sometimes two or three minutes in pick out traffic. I have a term, narrowing lanes and rates of way for accommodating other use of them. I guess your comment about uh, uh, getting the purposes and function of a street right in the first place is, is uh, key. Um, but we're facing a lot of struggles in the city. We, we uh, carry a lot of people over a lot of 
500 million riders a year. And we operate in both environments. We operate in the environment on the right, we operate in the right. environment on the left. And we do a pretty good job, actually. Um, so the buses operate on the arterial road network uh, throughout the city. And um, to be constrained by narrowing right away, narrow, narrow, narrow lane widths, when we're increasing the size of our vehicles, we carry the people who need to go all across the city. And we serve them in various directions. Um, it's not just one peak direction flowing in marks, it's yeah. all across the city. It's a struggle. How do you, how do you deal with that? It is one of the most difficult ones, and you're faced with that thing, the, the economic value of moving those people through versus the quality of the side street and on. This, uh, we're going to have to change through this. It is a bit of an idea. This is not an ideal one, it's just, it's grown like that. What the, the final nail in the coffin was these bike lanes later in addition later on, so that made everyone breathe in a tiny little bit more. One of the only reasons, buses don't, go down there very frequently because the tram or so the bus is quite rare. The bus couldn't go down that lane. Like the bus driver, the tram driver is kind of okay. He can't really muck it up. He's in the track. But the bus driver, he would struggle here. He's literally touching both lines with the tide. And he's probably overhanging the lane a tiny bit. That's all. So I'm not saying that. But the, everything has to be as well as building that retail edge or whatever land use edge is on. You just really got to be careful about what sacrifices you make. So if you do sacrifice width, say, look, I'm going to build a wider footpath and then everyone has to breathe in a tiny bit, or I'm putting in a new bike lane so everyone has to breathe in, you, have to, you do have to do that completely aware of what you're giving up and what length of street you're giving it up for and what impact it has on the overall city compared to what advantage you get on the land use for that particular street. There's no magic there. You've got to work hard and find out what you're prepared to compromise. It's given size of our city and the complexities of those two different operating environments and that sort of thing. That's what kind of, in my mind, is a little bit different with transit and this option. It's a service to people everywhere across the city. Yeah, and there's, a, there's plenty of guys in my company, because we do more PT than anything else, who think that that is 100% correct. And I think they're undervaluing how important it is to have active economic edges on a street. Notwithstanding there's value in moving people around, but I think they're slow. And I'm quite prepared to be completely indirect and take a, have a longer discussion about it, but they're, they're both quite important. And one should, I guess, and the problem with that diagram is it makes you think that one automatically goes in front of the other. I, I wasn't. I wasn't. The, I, I think it, it raised the importance of what you're saying about getting the purpose and the function of the street, yep. right? especially from the transit perspective. What do you want it to do? Exactly. Before you say it's got this, but so automatically this is what. That's very important. I have no learned opinion on the exact economics of it, but I do know that people flock to those streets that have shade, both mechanical shade, as in awnings and, and street tree shade, and they anecdotally, and there's a guy in Australia doing a PhD thing on this about the effect of street tree on speed and so on, how do you behave? But anecdotally, people behave differently on streets with the big avenues of trees and stuff. But I have no learned opinion, if you know what I mean, but if you had a choice to have them or not have them, then you would have them. But shade of some description is extremely important. Uh, I guess in Australia and the Middle East and in some of those hot countries, I guess a little bit more, perhaps, but maybe shelter from weather is the same. Your street, if you want someone to stay there and spend time on sunny, or play hockey, or do something active in the street, then they have to immediately recognise that you're saying to them, you're welcome here, I'll look after you. You're supposed to do this stuff in this street. And 
and street trees are a very good way of making that overt invitation that as a human, you're welcome to come to this space. Thanks. Uh, Stephen, on behalf of the city of Toronto, everyone in this room, I thank you for taking the time out of your trip to Toronto to come and speak to us today. I think that I speak for everyone when I say that uh, your insights on the role of streets as generative economic activity and the importance of street design in supporting that function will be invaluable to us as we move towards uh, a more street streets in Toronto. So thank you very much. Thank you.